It was the most amazing prank ever. Hands down, the most masterful, ingenious, thought out, best laid out, most beautifully executed prank that this man had ever seen. Not only did it involve more than a dozen people, but it played out over almost a year's time. And the man who played the prank laid it out over that year to where it played out so beautifully. It was clearly the work of a master, of a genius when it came to its end. The fact that as he was doing it, playing with the 12-ish 13, 14 people that it involved, he, he kept a cool demeanor as if there was nothing going on, as if everything was normal. Emotionless, stone-faced, as this prank played itself out. On one hand, it was truly amazing, but on the other hand, it was one of the most touching moments when it was revealed the emotion that was involved was truly astounding. It was touching in a way that this guy had never seen before. And he sat and watched it all play out before him as the guy who played the prank masterfully executed it. Now, <clears throat> to understand the, pl- the prank, we have to back up. We have to understand the history of what's going on with this master prankster. So let's back up about 22 years in this guy's life. He was a teenager, 17 years old, arrogant, prideful, kind of the worst case scenario for a teenager. He was a bragster. He bragged to his brothers, you know, brothers, you're going to lay your heads down in front of you. You're going to bow before me one of these days. His brothers didn't exactly like it. He even told his mom and dad that one day they would bow before him. Kind of an arrogant jerk. And one day, his brothers are out in the field and they see that arrogant jerk of a brother coming toward them. That little punk. And they decide, you know what, we're going to get him. We're tired of his pride. We're tired of his boasting and his bragging. We're going to get him. And so they capture him, they throw him in a pit, they see some guys coming, and they sell him as a slave to these guys coming through their land. And so this 17-year-old kid finds himself sold into slavery, being transported in a slave transport to a foreign country. In that foreign country, he gets sold to an officer, a high up, a guy who literally consults face to face with the king himself. Not only the king, the king of the most powerful kingdom in that day and time. So he's in a pretty good place. And the guy who buys him, this officer, realizes pretty early on, man, everything this kid does succeeds. It's like he's got the golden touch. I'm going to put him over my household. And so he promotes this kid to the ruler of his home. If there's a food, if there's a meal getting served, this kid was in charge of it. If the servants needed to do a job in the house, this kid supervised it. Pretty soon, the officer's wife starts taking notice of this pretty handsome 17-year-old kid. And one day, she decides she's going to act on these looks, and she seduces him, or attempts to, brings him into her bedroom. And he realizes pretty early on what's going on, and so he turns to run, and as he does, she reaches out and grabs his coat. And not thinking in the moment, he just wants to get out of that situation, he just reaches back and pulls the coat off and takes off running. And she uses that coat that evening... The husband comes home. She uses that coat as evidence that this young man, this ruler of his household, this lead servant, tried to do a pretty heinous crime. And he's falsely accused, not only that, convicted, and he is thrown in prison for what he's done. It's actually described as a pit. It's not just a cushy prison 
where you've got cable TV and four square meals. We're talking a pit in the ground. Things were looking up for this kid even though he was a slave, but now he's not just a slave in a foreign land. He's a slave in a foreign land, in a prison in a foreign land. And early on, the prison guards start to notice, man, everything this kid does succeeds. Everything he touches turns to gold. And everybody likes him. We're promoting this kid. You're not just a prisoner. You're the prisoner of prisoners. Yes! Dream come true. He becomes the head of all the prisoners. So if the prisoners are eating, this guy took care of it. If the prisoners had a complaint or got hurt, this guy took care of them. One day, a couple of his fellow prisoners wake up one morning and they go, man, we had crazy dreams last night. And they're just chit-chatting and they look over at this guy, the, the leader of the prisoners, and says, what do you think about these dreams? And the kid looks at him and says, well, one of you, in three days... You're going to be declared innocent. You're going to get your job back with the king. You're going to get back, be put back in your place of glory. You, this other guy, you, you're a, in three days, you're going to get hanged for your crime. And three days later, what happens? The one guy is declared innocent and is promoted back into his old job where he is in the place of glory in front of the king, serving the king, living the life. And the other guy gets hanged. Just as this guy had said, holy cow. Now two years pass, and the king himself has a really crazy dream. Not just a crazy dream, two crazy dreams. He wakes up that morning and goes, whoa, that was a crazy dream. So he goes to his advisors. He says, hey, here are my dreams. What do you guys think about it? And they go, I don't know. What did you have to drink last night? We have no idea what this means. And that guy, that employee who had gotten his job back two years earlier goes, hey, king, back in prison, there was this guy that could actually tell you what your dreams meant. You should go ask him. Okay, go get him. So they pull him out of the pit, and they shave him up and clean him up and put some clothes on him that don't smell like a porta potty And... He goes before the king, and the king says, dude, I had this dream last night. I was sitting by the river, beautiful scenario, seven really beautiful, plump, healthy cattle are grazing next to the river, and then all of a sudden, seven skinny and unhealthy and sickly cattle come up, and they eat the seven healthy ones. It was so crazy, it woke me up. So I went and got a glass of water and I came back to bed. I went to sleep and I had another crazy dream. A, a, a stalk of grain with seven healthy, plump heads of grain on it. And then seven skinny heads popped up around them and ate the seven healthy ones. Freaked me out. I woke up from that one too. What does it mean? And the young man looks at him and says, you're going to have seven years of overabundance in your kingdom. Your crops are gonna produce more than your people could ever imagine eating. You're gonna have so much food, you're not gonna know what to do with it. But those seven years of prosperity are gonna be followed by seven years of extreme famine, the likes of which you've never seen before. There will be no food in the land. Your people will starve. The king goes, oh wow. Um, what should I do here? You know what? I'm hearing good reports about you, young man. The prison guards tell me you're kind of the, the king of the prison. You're the prisoner of prisoners. I even hear that back in the day you worked for one of my officers and he thought pretty highly of you too. How about this? You claim you have this God that really kind of has your back. Do you think you could be in charge of taking care of my kingdom and making sure that everybody has food during those seven slim years? And the young man looks at him and says, with the help of my God, yes, sir, I can do that. And the king looks at him and says, I'm promoting you. You're not anymore the prisoner of prisoners. You are a king in my kingdom. There is only one person in the entire kingdom that will be greater than you, and that is me myself. 
You are second in command. What people tell you to do, they will do it. You tell them what to store, they will store it. And so he's promoted, and that's where we pick up on our prank. Seven years of prosperity, things are good. Two years into the famine, things are bad. And so this young man is sitting on his throne, giving out the food, selling the food that he has stored up for his king for seven years. And off in the distance, he sees a small group of foreigners coming to buy food from him. And you know what? He recognizes them. That small group of foreigners are his brothers that 22 years earlier sold him into slavery. Whoa. So they come forward. He's already got the prank figured up in his mind. He looks at those foreigners and he goes, hey, you guys are spies. You're here to check out our defenses and steal from me. No, 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 no. No, we're just here to buy food. We're starving. We need some food. We brought some money here to let us have some food. And he says, I tell you what, to prove that you're not spies, I'm going to keep one of your brothers in my prison. I'll give you your food. You go back to your dad. You say you've got a younger brother that didn't come with you. You come back with that younger brother, and I'll release the brother that I have in my prison. And you'll prove to me in that moment that you're not spies. Okay. So one brother stays. The other brothers go off back home. They tell dad what happened. They said, we got to go back and we got to take the youngest with us. And dad says, oh, no, you're not. That crazy man will keep my youngest son. His only brother has been killed. He's the only son of that wife, the wife that I love. There's no way you're taking that kid with you. Okay, dad. So time passes. They eat all the food. Now they got to go somewhere and buy food. But guess what? There's only one person in the entire known world that has food at that time, and that's this young man. So they go to dad. Dad, we got to go back. We'll take the youngest brother with us. We'll protect him. We'll take care of him. So they go back. The young man sitting on his throne sees the foreigners coming, looks at them. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. They come back, and he says, you guys, you spies, you've come back. No, 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 we're not spies. Look, we brought our youngest brother back. Okay, why don't you come eat a meal with me? So they all sit. He fellowships with them. He hangs out with them. He has a good time. And he says, all right, guys, you you proved you're not spies. I'll fill your bags with food. You guys head back. Thank you for proving that you're not the spies that I thought you were. And then he leans over to his servant, and he says, hey, fill their bags, but... uh, When you fill them, go ahead and take my most expensive silver cup and hide it in one of their bags. Matter of fact, hide it in the youngest one's bag. This is going to be great. And so the servant fills their bags with food, but he hides a silver cup inside that youngest brother's bag. Hides it in the bag. They take off. The young man sends his servants after them. Dude, we were so nice to you. We gave you food. We made it clear that we don't think you're spies anymore and you stole from us? No, 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 we didn't steal from you. Oh, prove it. They open up the bags, bam, silver cup sitting there in the youngest brother's bag. And so they go back and they stand before him and he's got all of his brothers that he recognizes and remembers sitting in front of him begging for mercy And he bows his head. I want every single one of my servants to leave this room. Leave me with these foreigners. Get out. Everybody leaves. And the man looks up with tears streaming down his face. And he says, guys, I'm Joseph. I'm the brother that you sold into slavery. I'm alive. And they're dumbfounded. (laughs) What? The second in command of all of the kingdom is our brother. We are in trouble now. Pretty amazing account, isn't it? Pretty amazing that God could take this crazy situation and make it into what it is. Joseph plays out this brilliant prank on his brothers. 
Um, we'll catch up with the rest of the story here in just a second. We're on a new series, Heroes. And over the next several weeks, we're going to start looking at different men and women in God's word who God used in amazing and powerful ways to change the world. Uh, We're going to look at stories of hope. We're going to look at stories of God's faith and God's action in our lives. We're going to look at stories of amazing redemption through the power of God. And so guys, don't miss this next several weeks. It's going to be an amazing series. Now before I go any further, happy Father's Day. If you are a dad, a stepdad, a foster dad, a half father, I don't know, if you, whatever you are, if you're a granddad, thank you. Thank you for investing in the lives of our children. We are honored to get to celebrate with you today. Um, take your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 50. It's the very last chapter in the first book of the Bible. So if you're not familiar with the Bible, just open the front cover. The first book you're going to get to is Genesis. Go to the very, very end of that section, that book of Genesis. Chapter 50 is where we're going to be. And just put your finger there. We're going to come back to this chapter uh, uh, later on in the message. Now, Let's think about this account for just a second, the the account of Joseph. The the story that I just told you is found in Genesis chapters 37 to 50, uh, the very end of the book of Genesis. Joseph was the son of Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. Uh, and, And they were the promised nation. And everything that I talked about in this story took place. Uh, According to Genesis 37 through 50, that's how it played out. And so we're looking at this, and think about Joseph's life for just a second. Was Joseph's life a life of comfort and ease? No. If you looked at Joseph's life, you would characterize his life by suffering and pain, wouldn't you? You would look at that life and go, this guy went through some junk, He went through some pain. He went through some discomfort. He went through a lot of difficulties. I mean, think about it. How many of you would enjoy if the Canadians came down from the great white north and kidnapped you and took them as your slaves? First off, biggest surprise ever, right? The Canadians coming to kidnap us. But how many of you would say, yeah, I want to be a slave. That sounds really fun. No, that's not something that anybody would enjoy. But that's what happened to Joseph. Not only that, he wasn't just a slave. He was sold into slavery by his own brothers. Talk about a stab in the back. And then things start to look up for him. He gets promoted to the head of household of this guy named Potiphar. He was the king, he was the leader of the king's guard, Pharaoh's guard. And then he gets falsely accused. How many of us in this room go, you know what? Sounds like a great idea. I'm going to go turn myself in for a crime that I didn't commit and serve a life sentence in prison. That sounds like a great idea, right? No. That is not something that any of us would relish or look forward to. Not only that, prison in that day and time, I've already described it a little bit, it wasn't a concrete floor with meals served every day and cable TV. The Bible describes this prison as a pit in the ground. In other words, you were arrested and you were literally thrown into a hole with a bunch of other guys with no bathroom, with no sanitary conditions, and you were left there and they would throw food in every day and you'd have to fight for your food. It wasn't exactly a comfortable, humane situation for these guys. I don't know about you, but That's not what I define as a happy, comfortable life. But it does turn around for him, right? God redeemed all of that and made him one of of the most powerful men in that time period. There was no kingdom greater in that day and time than Egypt. Egypt was the pinnacle of power in Joseph's time. And Joseph becomes second in command of that kingdom. So, yeah, he suffered. Uh, He went through some trials. He went through some difficulties and pain. So, Before we go any further, let me explain, where does suffering come from? 
What's its source? I'm going to give you three sources real quick of where suffering comes from. It's not in your notes. If you want to write them down, feel free. Uh, But the first source of suffering is our own idiotic decisions. Right? We suffer when we make stupid decisions. Now, we just finished up a series called How Not to Be an Idiot. So if you want to learn how to avoid these stupid decisions, go to our website, calvarylhc.com, click on sermons, and watch that series. Because we give you a lot of biblical wisdom about how not to be an idiot and how to avoid some of the pain that you may cause on yourself. The second place that we get suffering from is the effects of sin in this world. When Adam and Eve ate that fruit off the tree, this entire creation, everything in the world got broken in that one moment. Sin entered the world and broke everything. And sometimes we suffer simply because our world is messed up by sin. It may not be any fault of our own. It may not be anything that we directly caused. It just may be the effects of sin around us. It's like going outside today at four o'clock. You have no control, but heat is going to hit you across the face whether you like it or not, and you have no power over that. Sometimes sin, beyond the power you have control of, will slap you across the face just because this world is broken. Although sometimes it's the sin of someone around you, maybe a family member or a friend, and they sin, and that sin ripples out and punches you in the face, right? Sin affects us and everyone around us. So sometimes your suffering may be the result of some stupid, idiotic decision of someone around you. The third source of suffering, and hear me out here, is God. Sometimes God puts us through what he calls trials, through difficult times, in order to do something in us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what pain and suffering has, what its purpose is in our lives. So that brings us to our first blank. I know some of you have been just, you got your pen, your hand has started shaking because you haven't written anything down yet. Here's your first blank. Your pain is your passage. Your pain is your passage. Listen to what James chapter one, verses two and through four says. Count it all joy, my brothers, When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Your pain, if lived in steadfastness, will lead to lacking nothing. The idea here is that God has a reason, a purpose for our pain. You see, suffering is not an obstacle for God. Suffering is an opportunity for God. When we go through difficult times, no matter what the source may be, God uses that opportunity to open the door for us to have new things in our life. He's going to open new and greater opportunities through the suffering and the pain and the trials and the difficulties that you and I go through if we embrace his purpose in that. Let me give you an example. I've shared many times that as a child, I was physically abused by a family member. Physical abuse enough that I went to the hospital for the abuse that I sustained. I have physical limitations today because of the abuse that I sustained. But do I live in that abuse? Do I uh, identify myself? Is my identity and definition of myself found in being an abuse victim? No. Rather, God has opened up a beautiful opportunity for me in being the victim of abuse in the past. I have an opportunity to speak into people's lives and touch people's lives that I would not get to touch otherwise. I can't tell you how many people I've gotten to speak to and influence and help grow and heal in their abuse because I also went through abuse. It's not an identity that I have, it's an opportunity that I have to do great things for God. He has used and is using my difficult past to help others. Not only that, and you may disagree with this, but I think 
that that pain that I endured as a child under the age of five, I truly, with 100% believe, that that pain has made me into the man of God that I am today. If it wasn't for that difficulty as a child, I would not be the type of person that I am today, good or bad. I think it's a good thing. But that's because I have embraced God's purpose in that pain. Now, I just said your pain is your passage. Here's your second set of blanks. But your passage is not your pain. Your passage is not your pain. And you say, whoa, 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 wait. You just saying, said my pain is my passage, and now you're saying my passage is not my pain? That doesn't make sense. Stop, follow, hold on, let me explain. It is true that your pain will open up doors and give you opportunities that previously were not available to you, okay? If you embrace God's purpose in what he's allowing us to go through or is putting us through, if you embrace that purpose, God will open up brand new doors and opportunities to you. But your pain is not the reason for these doors being opened or these opportunities. In other words, if you're focusing on the pain rather than God's purpose for it, then you have just made that pain an idol in your life. And God can't do anything if you're worshiping an idol. That's where we have to find the line and draw it. We cannot wallow in our self-pity. We can't live in the pain. We have to embrace the purpose of the pain. Now, many of you have not heard a word I've said because you've been going, what's under the cloth? I need to know what's under the cloth. You ready? Take a deep breath. Get yourself ready. Psych yourself out for this. Big deal. Here it is. A pile of bricks. You're welcome. Yay. So let me explain why there is a big pallet of bricks on our stage today. This brick right here, this is the abuse that I endured as a child. This is the pain. This is my past. I'm going to put this back on my my pile. This brick right here, this is a job that I had that I really hated. Not this job. I like my job now. Not this job. But this is a job that I hated, that a boss that I really did not enjoy working for. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this junk back on my pile. This one right here, this is a girl that I dated who broke up with me when I was 21 years old and broke my heart. Okay? Still have nightmares about that girl. I'm kidding. But I'm going to take this pain, I'm going to put it back on my pile. This right here, this is that time I made really, really, really stupid, idiotic decisions, and I ended up in jail. And so I served some time in jail for the bad sins that I committed. Uh, the, that's not a good one. <laughs> I'm going to leave that right there, too. These are my struggles. This is my pain. This is my past. Now, I've also got this rope, this cable attached. And this cable right here, this is, this is my blame. You know, I would have a much better life right now if it wasn't for these bricks right here. I'm going to blame my difficulties today on this pile of bricks. This is, this rope right here, this is me defining myself by that pile of bricks. You know what? I'm a victim. I'm a victim in this world. This rope, this rope is my selfishness. This is me saying, I'm going to linger on this pile of bricks rather than focusing on what God would want to do with my pain. You know what? I don't care how hard I pull. I don't care what I do. My 165 pound frame is not going to move those several hundred pounds of bricks. I don't care what I do. I don't care how much I pull. It's not going to happen, right? Can we all agree that that's not going to happen? I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. But why am I not moving in the direction God wants me to move? Is it God's fault? Is it the pain's fault that I'm not going forward 
with God. No. I'm the one that stepped into this. I'm the one that began to blame. I'm the, bega- the one who began to define myself by this pile. I'm the one who began to look at this selfishly rather than focusing on God, right? I'm the one who has tied myself to my pain and has prevented myself from going the direction God wants to take me. This is my fault. This is no one's fault but myself. I'm the one who put the blame here. I'm the one who defined myself by this. I'm the one who has been selfish rather than focused on God. And in doing that, we can also decide to not blame our past on our current situation. We can make the decision to not be defined by that pile anymore. We can make the decision to rather than focus on us and our pain and our wants and living in that comfort that I'm a victim, we can look at that pile and say, I'm not a victim, I'm a victor in Jesus Christ. And that's what the response should be here. Rather than focusing on the pain We focus on the redemption that God gives us. Does that make sense? You and I have the choice about how we respond to those difficulties. Look at Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So how should we respond to this big pile of bricks that each and every one of us have in our lives? How should we look at that pile of bricks and respond out of it? Well, both of the passages in James chapter 1 and Romans 5 that I've quoted today says that we're supposed to rejoice. Rejoice in the fact that God has found each of us worthy enough to push us out of our comfort zone through difficulties and make us stronger and better and more mature in him. We should rejoice. We need to realize that it's not about us, it's about God. When Jana and I first got married, we bought a little puppy. Uh, We bought a Hungarian pointer. It's a beautiful dog, uh, reddish, rusty red color, beautiful, beautiful dog, Um, We named him Caleb. He was an amazing dog, we loved that dog. Very obedient, very smart, very loving, but he had one major fault. He had separation anxiety like nobody's business. If you left him alone, he would freak out, like hardcore freak out. And so the first summer we had him, he was only about you know eight or nine months old. Um, I was on a mission trip in Missouri uh, with my youth ministry, and my wife felt pity on the dog and decided to put it in the bathroom instead of in its kennel. And so my wife goes to work. It was one of the few times that we left him alone all day long. Uh, She goes to work. She comes back around 5.30, opens the door to the apartment, and is hit in the face with an odor that no one wants to come home to. So she walked over to the bathroom door, and she turned that knob and opened it. And the horrific sight that laid before her was terrible. The dog, in its anxiety, had pooped on the floor, rolled in the poop, and shook the poop everywhere in the bathroom. He was covered, the walls were covered, the ceiling was covered, there was poop in the notches, in the grains of the wood, in the door. It was everywhere. You laughed, Jana did not laugh that day. It took her hours on a ladder to clean the poop from the crevices in the, uh, you know, the texture in the walls and the grain in the door and the light fixture, you know, all the, it was awful. I didn't experience it at all because I was on a mission trip serving the Lord. (laughs) What's the lesson here? Go on a mission trip. (laughs) But on a serious note, 
that dog, as much as I love that dog, that dog in that day ruined Jana's day. But how many of us, because of this pile right here, or another unnamed pile, um, how many of us live in this so much, we tie ourselves to this, that we sling our poop all over the people around us, right? We live in our pain so much, that we are defined by our pain so much that we stink everyone up in our life. We destroy and damage our relationships because rather than finding and looking for the redemption that God has in our pain, we tie ourselves to our pain. We, we define ourselves by our pain and we can't do that anymore. How did Joseph respond? Remember I told you to turn to Genesis 50? Now's the time to open your Bibles to that. Genesis 50, we're gonna read verses 19 and 20. What's happened is, is the entire family has moved to Egypt. Uh, Father lived a wonderful life from that point forward, knowing that his son was alive, and then dad dies. And the brothers go, oh, we're in trouble, because dad was the only one keeping Joseph from punishing us. And so they go to Joseph begging for mercy, and here's Joseph's response. Verse 19 in chapter 50, it says, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. You see what Joseph did there? He was a slave in a foreign land, and a slave and a prisoner in a foreign land, and he recognized that all that pain, that 20 some odd years of difficulty, was so that God could save his nation. He saw God's redemption. He embraced the reason for the pain. Not the pain itself, but the reason. So here's my closing question. Will you embrace what Jesus is trying to do with you?